If you'll be my bodyguard, I could be a long lost pair. Baby, when you call me, baby, you can call me, you can call me out. You can call me out. Hello. Welcome to Comic Book Herald Live. Oh no. Oh no. I forgot my hat. Oh goodness gracious. Oh dear. One moment. <whistles> Can't do this without the bull's hat. Who are we kidding? Who are we kidding? Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to Comic Book Herald Live. I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor in chief of ComicBookHerald.com. Chad Klein says, "Jens Jens Lechman? Is it Jens or Jens? I've enjoyed enjoyed Mr. Lechman's music as a, as a college lad, but I don't know. Jens Lechman did an amazing cover of Call Me Al by eliminating the chorus. Interesting. I gotta find that. I gotta find that. I get Mr. Lechman every so often on uh, on a playlist." Here and there. Here's a question to start things off on the stream that has nothing to do with comics. I'm uh, I'm at the gym today, and I'm working on my game, right? And I'm I'm gassed. I'm not. <laughs> I had a cold last week. I haven't been running much, right? I'm I'm shooting threes and I'm working on my game, but I'm I'm gassed big time. And I get to the end of the hour, I d I go hard for my last five minutes, and I'm tired. And I'm like, okay, I'm done. I'm I'm grabbing my knees. I'm doing all the old man stuff, right? And uh, and then on my headphones. Annie Up comes on, Robin Hood Theory. What is it, M.O.P.? What is your song, or what What are some songs that if they come onto a playlist, you can't stop working out? I couldn't end the workout on Anti Up, okay? Impossible. Absolutely impossible. I had to go another, you know, almost four minutes of step backs on, on a knee tendonitis. I got neck pain. I got all the 35-year-old game right now. But here's the thing. Ain't nobody in an open gym with no one around shooting a higher percentage from three right now. <laughs> Tell you that. We are going to talk about comics today. We'll probably do that on this stream as well. Interesting day of comics. I had like one possible window that we could discuss these. I got things going on on the usual Thursday times, but I knew. I knew. We got to talk Resurrection of Magneto. We got to talk um, uh, God's. We got to talk just Al Ewing in general, Immortal Thor. There was an issue of X-Force today. Let's do it. Let's do it. Get in your questions, get in your thoughts, get in your comments here. And you know what? Hit me with those tracks so I can add them to my workout playlist. Cousin Mark is coming in here with Jay-Z, You Don't Know. The irony here is I don't know that one. What's that on? Is that Blueprint Era? It is. It's Blueprint Era, 2001. Okay, so I'm sure I've heard it, but I maybe I haven't given it the respect it deserves. All right, we'll add that to the mix. Listen, I will just sit here and add songs to my Spotify. <laughs> last, last week, I did my taxes live and on air while I updated uh, the Comic Book Herald's best comics of all time. And I will... Uh, you think I'm above updating Spotify playlists? You think... <laughs> Listen, nobody, nobody is working harder against growing their subscriber base than I am. I'll tell you that right now. Tell you that right now. There's a nice Ice Cube reference by Justin M. In the chat, get in your thoughts, get in your comments in the chat here. I'll be going through them live as we go. Um, I mean, you didn't, you, Brayden, you didn't have to have to call me out for no hat like that. It doesn't look that bad. <laughs> Jarring fair, but come on, come on. It's not that rough. Is it? Oh boy, it might be. The hair's going, y'all. The hair's been going. It, listen, it's nice. The nice thing about having an incredibly bald dad who uh, makes neighbors drive by and say, your dad kind of looks like Larry David. The nice thing about that is you know what's coming. You know what's coming, right? You know it's going to go. There's there's never been a doubt, right? I'm not watching those hymns ads going, yeah, I didn't see this coming. I, I could really use some help with this hairline. It's I, I'm surprised 
that at 35, that I have as much hair as I do. I didn't think there'd even be this. Look at that. Come on. I mean, you got the camera on top of the, the balding crown there. It looks way worse that way than it does. <laughs> that's, that's definitely not doing me any favors. All right. Hat back on. Let's do this puppy. Let's talk some black panther shirt. Give me the power today. All right. Here we go. Let's talk. Yeah, no. When it when it goes, when it's really, I, I'm like, I'm like, like, in a centimeter of recession from just hardcore shaving it, I think all the time, you know, but it's, it, what, okay. <laughs> I've wasted enough of your time. <laughs> Let's do this. Somebody here says ultimates by Dennis camp is an instant add to the pull list. Uh, I saw somebody else asking about it. Uh, thoughts on Dennis camp on ultimates. Yeah, it makes so much sense. It's perfect. It's a fantastic addition to the ultimate universe. If you're not familiar with the work of Dennis camp, um, you know, a, a newer, uh, younger comics creator, 20th century men. I think the trade was released last year. Six issues started maybe in 2022. Um, one of the best books of, of the decade so far. Like when we get to the end of this decade, people are going to be going 20th century men. It is, it seems like, comics creators are like kind of in awe of that work. It's camp and oh, I should know their name. I got to look this up again. Um, but anyway, it's six issues. If you have not read 20th century men and you like superhero comics and you like Watchmen and you want to see someone evaluate those ideas and that level of thinking, um, but for the modern era and, and through the, you know, the increase in perspective that we have, you know, and the types of creators who can tell these stories, 20th Century Men is is literally must read material, I think. It is it is absolutely like 201, maybe 301 level superhero comics on the syllabus. You have to read that book. So Dennis Camp is, has produced that already. Also did Children of the Vault, the X-Men series, which came out, uh, you know, part of the Fall of X. I think it was the best Fall of X book. I don't know if there's really any argument to the contrary, frankly. So a creator I'm super excited about, super jazzed about, they're a fantastic fit for Ultimates. I think the biggest problem, or the biggest challenge, rather, with Camp on Ultimates is how does he find a way to say things that he didn't already say in 20th Century Men? How does he find a way to transcend the limitations and the barriers barriers of a, a Marvel comics enterprise of a Disney owned box, right? I'm curious to see how that might happen. Uh, I have confidence that it will happen. I think it's going to be really good. Listen, the ultimate universe is in fantastic position to be phenomenal for at least like a year or two, right? Hickman's ultimate Spider-Man and Geketto came out incredibly strong. We got Peach Momoko's X-Men coming. We got camp on ultimates at some point. And, and you got next week, Brian Edward Hill and who is it? Stefano Caselli on Ultimate Black Panther. That's the wild card, I think. That's the wild card. If that first issue comes out and and knocks my socks off, blows my hat back, shows off the receding hairline, we're in good shape. We're in real good shape. A lot is riding on Ultimate Black Panther as far as this being a line experience. There's no question we're going to have really interesting, cool books coming out of the Ultimate Universe comics, again, for at least a little bit of time. All right. Got a lot of thoughts in the chat today. People going hard. People going hard. Um, Emmanuel asked, Dave, thoughts about the TMNT relaunch by Jason Aaron and Joel Jones, Albuquerque, Cliff Chang, and Chris Burnham. Okay, yeah, so I did actually want to talk about this. Thank you. Emmanuel for asking. So TMNT is, is entering kind of a new phase, right? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The comics have been uh, Kevin Eastman and Tom Waltz driven for like the first 100 issues. Then Sophie Campbell took over. Just absolute lights out Turtles Reborn stuff. I That's when I like fell for Turtles comics was Sophie Campbell, um, especially when she was writing and drawing. That was just lights out. Great Turtles comics. And they're going to hit at 150 issue. And then it's going to reboot. And IDW's big announcement was like, yeah, we're bringing in Jason Aaron to do it, which I'm certainly not at the height of my Jason Aaron fandom. Um, I, I 
don't know how you could be. I, I just post Avengers, right? There's a lot of there's a lot of stink to wash off. I think, frankly, um, but certainly this is a creator with a tremendous pedigree. Uh, I have enjoyed their Marvel work, yes, but also scalped. I, even Once Upon a Time at the End of the World, which is a creator ongoing right now, um, is a good read. I enjoy I enjoy it when it's there. It's never like peak. It's never like my top. But I enjoy it when it's there. And so they're bringing in Jason Aaron. Like, that's a big move, right? The, the Turtles franchise has always been so Eastman and Lard and Tom Waltz um, driven. And then, of course, Sophie Campbell and, and many, many collaborators in the mix, right? But it they they it feels like, you know, they haven't gone out and gotten a superstar, you know, out from the Marvel and DC pool, right, to handle Turtles. So they got Jason Aaron, and then they announced that each Turtle, like the first four issues are going to have superstar artists. So Joel Jones, Raphael Albuquerque, Cliff Chang, which, man, am I looking forward to Cliff Chang and Ninja Turtles, and Chris Burnham. And so I'm I'm very interested in what that's going to look like for Ninja Turtles, but it also made me think, like my first reaction, obviously, just being X-Men War Brain, was like, I want to see that energy from the post-Krakoa X-Men. Like, I want to see Marvel out here flexing their power, flexing their pocketbooks, flexing their connections, right? And saying, look who we got. This artist, these superstars. If Cliff Chang was available for a Leonardo Turtles comic, then Cliff Chang should be available to write and draw New Mutants or whatever, right? Coming off Catwoman, Lonely City, come on, that would kill. That would kill. There is so much writing on the creative team selections, I think, for this X-Men relaunch. There is so, so much assuming about the types of people Tom Brevoort is going to bring in. Greg Land, Dan Slott, Christos Cage, all the old familiar players who've been around and gotten the job done. You know, yeah, Greg Capullo on Wolverine. Okay, that's a, that's a start. That's a name. That's interesting. How old are we going to go with that? How much legacy are we going to have there? How much are we going to reflect where comics are at now, not just the age of the individuals. Cause a lot of times you'll find, especially with the artists, it's like, Oh yeah. Like to get to superstar level, you know, a lot of these people have been doing it for 40 years, you know, like Capolo is a good example, right? I think still pretty hot as far as like comics fans are concerned. Capolo's doing Marvel Quasar back in the early nineties. Okay. Dude's been doing this for ages. Guy was drawing comics before I was born, right? There's a lot of those. That's not a problem. But the problem is, are they still peak of their powers type names? Uh, I want to see that for X-Men. I don't want to see, I just don't want to see Brevoort coming in and that sort of old familiar faces of like everybody who's kind of been within Marvel for the last, you know, three, four years, right? Like, listen, love Jed McKay comics. Jed McKay's great. Awesome Black Cat stuff. Awesome Moon Knight I haven't enjoyed Avengers to date, but I appreciate you got the opportunity. Jeb McKay can't be, it can't just be like McKay, Zdarsky. Um, uh, who else is just kind of in the mix? Obviously Al Ewing, but like presumably he's going out. You know what I mean? It can't just be the same people who've been doing Marvel Comics for the last little while. Even though I like a lot of their works individually. I'm saying, like, IDW's coming down. They're throwing down the gauntlet. They're saying, we're taking swings, baby. We're going to make these Turtles comics. You can you can assume that they are important. We are telling you they are important to us because we are making a genuine effort to go bigger than we have before. Okay? So that's, that's what I think about the big TMNT relaunch upcoming. I'm not, like... I, I don't know. I, I think I will wait until Buzz builds before I'm, like fully committed to that lineup, you know, of like, oh, yes, I'm reading this ongoing every week. Um, just that's just my relationship with the Turtles franchise. You know, I'll check it out when it's people are saying it's hot. Um, but I'm excited for for them. I think it could be interesting. <laughs> but I want that for X-Men. I'm hit asks was scalped peak Jason Aaron. I mean, that wouldn't be that much of an insult. You know, like it's his 70 issue vertigo run. Oh, I guess he's coming you know, like if that was, you know, if that was his best thing, like that wouldn't be because I like God of Thunder was great. And that comes, what is that? Mid end of scalped. Um, but probably, yeah. I mean, you know, I think 
best case scenario is is I think Aaron Peaks because you get that stretch of scalped into Southern Bastards. Thor's coming out around then at its best. You know, that's peak Aaron. So, I mean, yeah, it's probably a decade ago. I think being realistic. And then, I mean, Dowderman and, and Wilson carried a lot of the Jane Foster era of Thor. It's fantastic because they're fantastic. Um, and Aaron is doing good work on it, but I, but not peak. No. So, I mean, yeah, it's probably been a decade. Right? Can you bring it back? We'll see. Maybe it'll be there on Turtles. I don't know. Okay. Anything else we got to address up front? Let's see. Do, do, do. All right. Let's talk about some comics. Oh, one final thought that I thought of today, and I could not believe it took me this long to think about it. You know who should be the new editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics? Yes, they need a new editor-in-chief. Yes, they've stagnated. Yes, their current editor-in-chief pretended to be an Asian man to get work and has never really apologized for it. L. Ewing should be the editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics. I'm going to leave it there. I'm not even going to I'm not even going to explain. That should need no explanation. I think that's as clear an idea as I've ever had in my life. And it's it's tricky as Dave Sinney, obviously I am burdened with the power of prediction. And also just many great ideas for comics. This is among my best ideas. This is among the best ideas I've ever had for Marvel. Find me the person next week, Marvel says, we're turning things over, new leaf, new editor-in-chief, it's Al Ewing. Who's not over the moon about that? Weirdos and creeps, that's it. So unless you want to call yourself weirdo and creep, out of luck, out of luck. Come on, name Ewing the next editor in chief. And people, people's reaction to this, I think, uh, understandably, at first will be like, "But he's got to write the comics. How can he write?" They used to be editors and writers at the same time all the time, all the time. Stanley the Manly, Roy Thomas, Roy Boy, House Boy, Roy, Mark Grunewald, it used to happen all the time. Has it been 40 years? Sure. But is there a good reason for that? Probably. But bring it back. <laughs> make, make a special exception. Bring it back for Al. He can do it, Al. I have no question he can do it, Al. All right. Comics that came out today. How do we do that? Here we go. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Where should we begin? Let's begin with the resurrection of Magneto. We'll start there. I think that's fine. Um, getting, getting your thoughts on the on the Ewing editor in chief theory. I don't. I don't want to shut down conversation. I'm just saying, I don't need to defend the position. It's it's the best idea I've ever had. Okay, but getting your thoughts. I'm I'm not uncurious. Um, uh, Resurrection of Magneto, number one, launched today. You know what I underrated? Aside from just. Al, in general, I underrated the Defenders' work that Al Ewing and Javier Rodriguez did. I went re back and reread the first Defenders miniseries, five issues that came out in 2001, and then the second, Defenders Beyond, which came out in 2022. And I underrated those books badly. <laughs> like, I don't, it's not that I wasn't kind of into them. I was kind of into them. But reading them again now, I'm like, hot dog. These are like, respectively, some of the coolest damn Marvel comics of the last three years. I don't know what I was thinking. Javier Rodriguez and those colors are just lights out. Find me some Marvel books that look as good as those. And then you got Ewing and, Mor and, and Rodriguez just on there. Grant Morrison, Kirbyist. I mean, those are, man, you want to talk about a series... That is that has a love of Marvel Comics and the cosmos of it and the meta idea of this being the eighth cosmos because Marvel reboots and there's new ideas and stories undergo changes over time. It is so damn good. Holy moly, is it good. And I'm super glad I went back and reread it 
because yes, it was a fun experience, but two, it's incredibly relevant to Resurrection of Magneto. I tweeted this, so yes, I'm recycling a tweet. But Al, some some comics writers write for the single issue, right? W. Maxwell Prince on Ice Cream Man. Some writers write for the trade, right? Brian Michael Bendis, famously. Some writers write for the Omnibus, Jonathan Hickman, Marvel's work from 2008 to 2016. Al Ewing writes for the custom-bound, fan-made, put all your single issues together in an order that suits you personally, custom-bound Omnibus. Okay, have you ever seen these things? These are so, these are like my my dream products is fans who like, you know, you take a custom-made reading order, you put all your single issues into a box, you send it to this place, and they bind it like that was an Omnibus that actually existed. Okay, that's the Al Ewing Marvel Universe. <laughs> it, is, it is so sprawling across just the widest net of titles. It is preposterous. <laughs> but if you're invested and you're along for the ride, it all makes like a sick kind of sense. <laughs> you know, this, this is a bad example. It was a really bad example. Maybe I'm not even going to say it. It's such a bad example. It, no, it's, yeah, it's too bad of an example. I'm not going to use that. Um, Al Ewing writes for the custom bound omnibus, baby. Okay. And going Defenders, Defenders Beyond, not getting the third part of a Defenders greenlit for whatever reason, and then being like, fine, I'll just put it in Resurrection of Magneto. That's championship behavior. Okay. Those are the types of decisions <laughs> as like a single entity working within the framework and the structures of Marvel Comics, is Ewing, Ewing is just like telling his own stories. And he's like, fine, it's Resurrection Magneto. That does not prevent me in any way from continuing to tell my Defender story. It should. That should stop most people. <laughs> Somehow it doesn't stop him. Al brings in Blue Marvel and Galactus's mom. Galactus's mom has got it going on. And she really does. She's so cool. They're exploring the Dominions post Defenders Beyond, okay? Just Al connecting all the dots. A master, a damn master at play. Oh, I love it so much. We got Tarn coming back. Tarn's in the afterlife waiting for Storm. So, I mean, the premise of Resurrection Magneto technically is about Magneto. <laughs> Although it is hilarious to me that Marvel, this is a very Marvel move. We had a series called Trial of Magneto and we had a series about called Resurrection of Magneto. Trial was about Wanda and Resurrection so far is about Storm. <laughs> so we got two books with Magneto in the title. Neither book is about Magneto, although as Resurrection Magneto plays out, I'm sure it will be more and more. We got Ashake turning up. Is that Ashake's music? It is. Nobody talked more about Ashake circa Ten of Swords than your man right here. All right. My big theory with Ten of Swords was they showed like an image of Genesis and we didn't know Apocalypse had a wife at that point. So it was all like, who could this be? My big theory was it was Shake, who's this this long distant relative of Storm, who's like a magician. She's here. She's doing magic. Al playing with all the continuity dots. Listen, and honestly, notch another win for Dave Stinney. If I predicted back in Ten of Swords that a Shake would show up, I didn't. Listen, is there a statute of limitations on predictions? I don't think there is. I don't think there should be. So that prediction came true. It just came true, you know, three years later than you expected. But not than I expected. I just didn't tell you as much. Prophecy doesn't always, you know, give you every detail. It's a finicky business. We got Storm here meeting and talking to a Dominion. We have not had any characters prior to Rise of Powers interacting with Dominions. I guess Powers of Ten kind of almost does with the phalanxy stuff. Here we got Storm just straight up having a semi-understandable conversation with a Dominion. That's fascinating. And then again, Al using this as a stealth defender's next chapter. Just like playing 4D chess. All right. All of us sitting here reading our little paper comics, going about our days. Meanwhile, Al's like, 
floating among the clouds, operating on an entirely different plane of existence. And here's the thing, for the first time in my life, I feel like I'm on the same plane. <laughs> like, I feel like I am, I am so wholly on board. And this extended to a mortal floor for me today. Like, I am just so on Ewing's wavelength right now that we basically just have Loki telling Thor a story around a campfire. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> Give me more of this. Give me more of this comic. Oh, baby. Like, I was so into it. And it, it's kind of interesting now. We're seeing, because I think with Immortal Thor, one of the big questions has been like, what are we doing? What are we actually doing? And uh, today, and I think a couple times now, it's like, oh, Al's retelling Norse mythology through Thor and Loki's modern day eyes and kind of their marvelification, right? There's a marvelification of Asgardian legend and Norse mythology, right? You can read the Neil Gaiman and P. Craig Russell comic adaptations of Norse mythologies for like, you know, what Gaiman is very fond of, which is the sort of a version of the traditional texts, right? And then you have the marvelification. And what you what you find, and this is a lot in, um, in Gaiman Sandman work as well, and probably American Gods, is like, yeah, Thor's a dick. Like, Thor sucks, you know? And Loki is vengeful and spiteful and tortured by snake venom. And it's just, you know, it's all this awful stuff. And you're like, well, that's not in my Jack and Stan comics. <laughs> they don't do those things, right? So there's the Marvelification, the MCUification of heroic Thor. And I think retelling Norse mythologies with a Thor who regrets his cruelty with a Thor who's ashamed and, and kind of broken by having to relive his attempts to kill a giant giant who did not but attempt to feed them. It's pretty good. It's a pretty good use of like, okay, because I what I didn't want is I'm like, well, if, if Ewing's just going to kind of do the, well, we're going to go to the Norse mythology well and we're going to replay some of those hits. It's like, well, yeah, a lot of people don't know him. But, like, we have media doing that really well. I mean, yes, the game in Russell Norse mythology comics, but, like, how about God of War? You know? How about, uh, I just picked up, like, Hades, the Switch game. We have media doing, you know, retelling God, Lore Olympus. We have a lot of stuff doing that. Um, so I like this particular angle. I think it works for a Thor comic. I, and then there's, like, there's this element to it that is just absolute bait for me, which is meta stories within stories. Okay. You got, if you show me a, and I've said this before, you show me a comic within a comic, I'm in, I'm in no further questions, your honor. Okay. Absolute meta stories, cheesecake, the end of this comic where you've got Dario Agar, head of Roxxon working with Enchantress and Executioner but he's reading a comic about Thor that Loki is simultaneously telling Thor, telling Thor. I mean, come on, come on. I love it. I'm, I'm just completely captivated by this book, but even so, you know, I will say like six issues in it. There's definitely an element of like, it feels like it's missing a core a little bit. You know, it feels like it's missing. Cause if you, if you package this in a trade and you're like, check out these first six issues of Thor, it's hard to summarize, right? It's kind of hard to be like, this is what this is, you know? Like, yes, it feels like it's still building. Yes, it feels like there's a lot of runway. I'm excited about it, and I'm generally enjoying it. But again, I feel like you want your mission statement to be a little clear at this point. I, otherwise, I think the biggest critique I see right now is like, I, I think both Ewing and Kieran Gillen are pretty high on that Neil Gaiman Sandman, the magic of stories bag. <laughs> I think they both like that a lot. If that's not your cuppa, as they say across the pond, if that's not your cup of tea, um, you know, the power of stories and how stories are themselves a kind of magic, this is all probably pretty irritating because <laughs> they're, they're super into that idea. I want to see them expand on that. I want to see them take that several levers, levels deeper, it feels like Ewing is finding a way to do that. It feels like he's trying. Um, and I'm curious to see how or if he can pull that off. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I had a great time 
with Immortal Thor. I thought Resurrection of Magneto was very strong. It does... Yeah, Al Ewing working in the White King's wildness that he did in Venom. Come on, just an absolute master. Um, okay, I think the one question with Resurrection Magneto is like, to what end? Right? So you got Storm shaking the the gates of death or whatever and talking about bringing Magneto back, talking about maybe bringing back some other mutants that had died. She's in the waiting room, which is where... Wanda had magically set up like, oh yeah, you can just resurrect mutants from here. Um, it's setting the stage, certainly for Storm coming back with a boatload of mutants. Probably. And probably this is how, instead of Krakoan resurrection, systematically bringing back all the mutants over time, you know, from Decimation and all that, probably this is like a big conclusion thing is, is Storm bring back all the mutants. And then with the reboot, Basically, it'll be like, yeah, all the mutants that ever were are back on the table. Here, that's how I anticipate this will play out. Um, I'm very curious to see, like, the next issue especially, to see how Ewing's going to justify and kind of explain, like, you know, Magneto seemed pretty pretty content in having lived a full life. You know, he made that pact with the Araco mutants that he would not be resurrected. I think forcing him out of that is always is like not surprising, but I'm curious character wise, you know, the characterization of that, how is that going to work? Um, but yeah, we're going to get Magneto back. We're going to get a boatload of mutants back with storm and it's going to help them defeat Orcus. Like it all seems super clear, <laughs> right? I mean, that's definitely the way this is playing out. Um, I wonder what I wonder the most is I said it when it was announced, but I mean the, the core series should be Ewing and Gillen, right? Pretty clearly. And I wonder, because Ewing is kind of, again, shunted off to this sort of weird side hustle, how much he'll actually get to do with Dominion and the cosmic side of things, which is what he's best at, which is what he's better than literally anyone at, actually. You know? Um, I hope the answer is a lot more. You know, but it's like, you know, because it's like, all right, if you if you have somebody, I'm very happy. I'm very confident with Kieran Gillen handling those big powers of 10 type questions in Rise of Powers. I'm very happy. I'm very confident with Al tying them in his defender stuff and continuing the conversation there. I am terrified of the prospect of Jerry Duggan trying to do the same and follow the House of X. Right. So, you know. Give, give Al the runway. That's all I'm saying. He's the best. Speaking of liking Al Ewing comics, let's talk about Gods number four. Gods is at the midway point, y'all. Gods by Jonathan Hickman, Valerio Schiti, collaborators. We are at the midway point. Four of an announced eight issues have been released including an oversized issue number one. There's a lot of gods out there. Okay. Midway point. I don't expect this will go past eight. Tom Brevoort is on record in his, his newsletter saying, you know, if sales sustain it, we'll do more than eight, which is what they always say. But if we're actually at the halfway point, you feel like we're at a satisfying midway point? I mean, I think the pacing is glacial. And I think that can work if you're in it for the long haul. Certainly if you're not and reading it, reading this book on a, a one a month basis, insane behavior, <laughs> delusional, right? Clearly going to play together much better at the end of the thing, which again is how most comics work. But I think gods will especially benefit from a read at the end of this. I still think it should have been released as just a like black label ask, you know, graphic novel, but it's not here it is. Midway point. What are we doing? What is this book? Okay. The premise is still rethinking the cosmic landscape. We have made scant progress there. And I think what is hard for me, a core limitation, is so you got Hickman fighting against the Starlin verse. 
in doing this, right? If it's a reimagining of Marvel Cosmic, then you're reimagining primarily Jim Starlin ideas from like the 1970s, which, hey, it's 2024. If somebody wants to take that on and think about what can the in-betweener be now and Lord Chaos and Master Order and Eternity, I, I'm still very into that idea. You know, I'm not a, I'm a huge Jim Starlin fan. I love that stuff. But like, hey, we've had it. We've had it. I've read those stories. I've read those comics. Somebody wants to try something new. Jonathan Hickman is one of my favorite creators at Marvel ever. Like, absolutely. Take a swing. But one of the problems you have now, too, is so you're fighting against the Starlinverse and kind of the preconceived notions of what these entities are and how they function. But you're also fighting against the Al Ewing Cosmic Universe, which Ewing has been doing and is doing it better right now. Like, I think Ewing's Cosmicverse stuff which, yes, is sprawled across a ludicrous number of series, is running laps around anything Hickman and Skeety have put to page so far in Gods. And it's a weird thing where we have all these cosmic explorations and all these things kind of defined so interestingly and effectively in books like Defenders, and then for Gods to step in and like be doing a, a totally its own thing. I feel like this book would be better off not being in continuity. I mean, in part, it's because I don't think Hickman and Skeety have the juice. But also, like, I just don't think it jives with what Marvel Cosmic actually looks like right now. You know? Like, they, they need to decide who actually has the keys here. Who's actually driving? We have, like, eight hands on the wheel right now. Because it's not just Hicken and Ewing. It's like anyone can come in and kind of try to define this stuff. And it's like, we you have a good answer, actually. You know? Like, Ewing's Cosmic Verse is awesome. But if you think that, you know, Hickman and Skeety have more prestige and are better suited to redefine it, you know, I get that, right? From a, from a sales perspective, from a communications perspective... <laughs> But, like, then somebody shut Ewing down because <laughs> he's still going. He's still going, you know. Um, this book is fine. But, again, and I said this with issue three, my, my expectations for the work are sky high because that is what Hickman in particular has, where he has set the bar. You know, with Ultimate Spider-Man, it was great because the bar was met and exceeded. And it's it's a great fit. With gods, we are well below the bar. I don't know. I just, I constantly, I'm like, you could just read Hellblazer and get a better win experience. You could read Al Ewing's Cosmic Verse and get a better Cosmic Pantheon experience. If you want, you know, Hickman and Skeety attempt some structural intrigue here with returning to the same page of Wynn and Doctor Strange stopping time and trying to get Wynn to punch out this, you know, in-betweener type guy. But just visually, it's confused. It's repetitive and confused. And, and this, I would say kind of a structural failure. Ultimately, like it could have been a cool trick. And instead, I just found it kind of irritating. Um, we're halfway. <laughs> we're more than halfway. I don't think God's works. I'm curious, you know, for those of you that do. And again, I don't know if it was like doing its own thing in kind of a black label prestige thing. I'd probably have a little more patience for it. Um, if it was, if it was just all these ideas and like, you know, Hickman was doing this thing with universal abstracts and introducing uh, Oblivion. And it wasn't like simultaneously trying to rework. Because the, the, the most annoying thing about it is the thing that I was most excited about, I guess, right? Is this idea that it's trying to rework the cosmic pantheon of Marvel and all these ideas and concepts that have had such an important role in the Marvel Universe for such a long time. And it's not doing that. <laughs> like it's it's barely doing that so far and it's doing it ineffectively and it's it doesn't seem to be delivering on that promise at all 
you know? Um, if it was just like, this is a side hustle and schools of magic in the Marvel Universe, and these are some new characters, and they're interacting with all of these, you know, Marvel Universe cosmic stuff, I'd probably be more on board. Like, I like the addition of some of these characters. Like Mia, even Dimitri and Wynn. But like this being tied into some in-betweener Cosmic Pantheon stuff, I'm like, this book doesn't have the juice. I think I think the Shield minis, you know, are probably the, are the things that people are going to compare this to inevitably. Um, those are way better. Those are much tighter. Those declare much earlier what their aims are, right? Just even what they're trying to do. And it's, you know, secret societies, competing secret societies, trying to control the shape of the world and defend it from Marvel cosmic threats. And he pulls in Nostradamus and Isaac Newton and, and the Richard's dad and, you know, Howard Stark, right? And these these connective tissue. But it all it all works. It all builds to something. Um, I mean, gods would have to have, like, just a lights-out back half for me to do a 180 on it. Which is not, if you had told me, and somebody pointed this out to me, I forget who, I apologize for taking the idea, but like, if you had told me five months ago that I'd much rather have Ewing and Rodriguez doing a third part of their Defender series than a Hickman-led Gods and revising the Cosmic Pantheon, I would have said, no way. I would have said, no, absolutely not. I, I'm dying to see Hickman's vision for that. What is Hickman's vision for that? What is it actually? And like, listen, there's a lot of value, I think. You know, there's an Alan Moore quote that people like tossing around, which is like, you know, it's the artist's job to tell the audience what they need because the audience doesn't know if they did, they'd be the artist. I'm paraphrasing, but something to that effect. I, I do think there's value there. I do hold stock in that, right? Hickman is a master creator fantastic storyteller. He gets to dole out information at his cadence and as he sees fit and as he thinks the audience needs it. The pacing is glacial. And it's not just that it's, you know, spaced out on a single issue basis. It's not going to feel less, these four issues are not going to feel less glacial all read together. There's still going to be very little that has actually happened. You know? Um, yeah, I, I, it's just, it, man, I, I wish I was able to get into this book, but I definitely can't. Um, I, I respect and, you know, appreciate anyone who does. It's not like I read it and I'm like, this is a travesty or something, right? Like, I don't think it's actively harmful. I just think for the position it's in and for the creators involved, it is less than, um, and that is a disappointment because I wanted to love this book, right? All right, getting your questions, getting your thoughts. Let's talk about what's going on. I'm gonna take a sip today from our sponsor. Our sponsor today is Uneaten Pizza and a half glass full of water that I'm just gonna say it could be, could have fewer things floating in it. You could have fewer things floating in this water I'm about to drink. Vengeance asks, is Morrison's Green Lantern any good? Speaking of things that are good, I watched the movie Vengeance, written by B.J. Novak, and directed, I think, starring. Um, not that long, Ryan from The Office. Not that long ago. And uh, that was really good. I would recommend the movie, Vengeance. Okay, is Morrison's Green Lantern any good? I don't know why you're asking that, but yeah, <laughs> it is. Uh, it is also really dense. It's really dense. That is a, that is Morrison, I don't know, at their most, but if it, to me, it felt like at their most, like, 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 like they're not going to hold your hand at all. You know, they're like, I will take you 30% of the way, but you need to meet me 70% of the way. I, th I think that can be really tricky when it hits, and you know why it hits. It's really good. 
But there are moments when it's like, what? What are we doing here? But yeah, I actually like that Green Lantern run a lot. Let's see. Nobody except me says, crazy how Hickman on Gods and Spider-Man and Ultimates is somehow less interesting than Ewing, Doug, and Gillen. Oh, I don't know if I'd go that far. I wouldn't go that far. I think the Ultimate Universe stuff is incredibly exciting right now. I think that's in great shape. Uh, I think, listen, if I have to, if you're making me rank them, you know, Hickman v. Ewing v. Gillen, don't put Duggan in that mix. That's not fair. Um, right now, it's Ewing. <sighs> wow, that's hard. If we're just going, whose Marvel books am I the most excited to read? If we do it that way, whose Marvel books are you most excited to read right now? Hickman's, Ewing's, or Gillen's? Gillen's limited by options because, well, no, I guess they're doing Rise and that X-Men Forever stuff. Uh, oh, man. Okay, yeah, I guess it is Ewing, Gillen, Hickman. It is, but it's hard because I'm very excited for the next issue of Ultimate Spider-Man and what's come in the Ultimate Universe as a whole. Very excited for that. So it's not like that's not, I mean, listen, that's a killer big three. Bulls would kill for that big three. That's no Vooch to Rose and Kobe White, baby. <laughs> the most Bulls thing ever this year that we're probably going to fight for the play in again, despite the fact that we're just absolutely stuck as like the ninth or 10th best team in the East. Shouts to my dad's Milwaukee Bucks for getting a new coach this week, by the way. Shouts to the Packers. Got a lot of Packers fans in my life. Made it fun. Made it real fun. Did not make any sense to me how they were doing so well. Oh, by the way, a, a number of people have asked on these streams, Dave, what are the Bears going to do they, with their number one pick in the NFL draft? And I've kind of hemmed and hawed and said this and that. You know what the real answer is? They're going to do whatever the ensures they have the exact same problem <laughs> they've had for the entirety of the franchise, which is they're going to ensure they can do whatever it can to get the wrong quarterback and to not be able to develop them into a, a superstar quarterback in the NFL. <laughs> so whatever, whatever it takes, whoever they have to draft, if they trade the pick and keep fields, whatever it takes to make sure that the Bears never have a star quarterback, they will find a way to do that. <laughs> that is that is our lot in life. Um, and we will just, like, the Packers just fall into these quarterbacks. I mean, good grief. Tell me they go Favre, Rodgers, and now Jordan Love looks amazing. That is so unfair. <laughs> Completely unfair. I will continue to live vicariously through my dad's fandom of the Packers. Chris Cueva says, no more sports, please. Chris, Chris. You're at, you're at the wrong show. <laughs> you came you came to the wrong show. This is the this is like one of how many places where someone might talk about comics and sports. Like two? What is it? Me and off panel? <laughs> right? <laughs> like there, there aren't that many places. I think we're gonna be okay. Um, all right. What other questions do we got here? Jordan says, did you hear about the Rocks on Thor book with Greg Land? I sure did. I sure did. Um, okay. People, so Greg Land is famous, for those of you who don't know. Longtime Marvel artist for, I would say, there's a really good comic strips video. And I think it's called like Tracing the Arc of Greg Land or something that goes into, um, you know, how Greg Land like traces a lot of his art. And, you know, like, a, I think porn has been used, I think, like, Sports Illustrated covers, um, other art from other comics artists, right? And probably if you're, if you're a real artist, there's some debate about, you know, when this is and isn't okay. Um, and, I, and I think ultimately as a consumer and as a critic, right, there's that question of, like, well, ultimately, even if that's what they're doing, how does it make me feel? And I think in the case of Greg Land's 
art, it often makes people feel very badly, <laughs> right? Um, there's a lot of readers who would be like, oh, this is really off-putting stuff. There are some famously bad panels of, for example, like Ultimate Sue Storm, just with the biggest porn star of face. But like it's supposed to be her smiling and having a conversation with Reed. Um, I think Land, when he's not doing people, like when he's doing monsters and things, like he can, I don't know that this is an artist without talent, but the reputation is great tracer and somehow keeps getting Marvel work by virtue of, you know, kind of just like failing upwards by getting the thing done. I mean, I think, you know, there's a reality and I live this reality, but it's like, if you're just like, okay, at a middle position in a company and you just don't cause issues and your stuff gets done and you're just like, you know, I mean, listen, we could throw race and gender into it too, <laughs> right? But it's like, you can kind of just sit in that position. You don't have to change the world, you know? And there seems to be this sense with land that it's just like, well, he hits his deadlines. <laughs> so he's going to keep getting work anyway. He keeps getting work. He got announced. So Marvel announced there's going to be the Roxxon Age of Comics. And it's an immortal Thor thing. And Al Ewing's been building to this, right? We saw a little bit in the issue today. Um, and Al, there's going to be a Roxxon Age where it's going to be like this corporate, corporatification of Thor's Marvel Universe. Which how Ewing is going to critique or satirize how everything in media right now is kind of moving to like this just absolute soulless corporate death within a book published by the Walt Disney company is going to be really fascinating. You know, like there's going to be some stuff in there that I think will hit, but then it'll also be like, and this is a Marvel comic published by Disney. But anyway, what the question is here is, uh, Oh, Greg Land's going to be drawing that. And that is like, like my, I actually started twitching because I was really excited about the idea you know, and I'm like, you know, obviously, like I've been talking today, I'm super into Al Ewing's Immortal Thor and all the comics he's doing. And that's like, yeah, Greg Land's going to do it. And it's like, what the hell? Like, what a, you know, like, it's like uh, somebody comes up and gives you, you know, a, a deep dish pizza. And then they, and then they spike it out of your hand. And it's just all in the mud. And you're like, what the, f what just happened? Um, that's, the, that's what it's like to see Greg Land's going to be doing this comic. There was then an immediate, like, oh, this is a stealth meta commentary because land is perfectly suited to display the sort of plastic corporate nature of Roxxon. Y'all, I promise, listen, Al Ewing will make that work. He's that good. But I promise you the artist and, and editors here are not thinking about satirizing their own artist. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'd be really shocked, be really surprised, okay? Um, so, yes, I saw that announcement. Yes, it was simultaneously exciting and dejecting. And, yeah, my eye is still twitching a little bit. My eye is still twitching a little bit. All right, what else do we got? Do, 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 do. Daryl says, if Marvel can keep hold of Kieran Gillen, he'd do a great ultimate comic. He would, uh, but I believe Kieran has announced that he will not be doing Marvel stuff after the X-Men stuff is done. I think he will be going creator-owned, and frankly, we're all the better for it, because Kieran Gillen makes good comics, and whatever his next creator things will be pretty interesting. What else do we got? Xavier says, I disagree. Tracing wouldn't matter so much if quality followed. Land traces himself now. <laughs> that's that's such a cool flex. <laughs> that's an insane flex. Like, yeah, I'm copying my old work and repurposing it. It's it's kind of like the human equivalent of like generative AI. Right? Is like just this idea that art is just a thing to be like like it is it art is a thing to fill space on a page and the actual like act of creation is meaningless i've never ever heard gredlang speak for himself on this 
Maybe these things exist. Maybe he's like the coolest guy. <laughs> I have no idea. He's just a very notorious figure, I think, fandom-wise. All right. Last chance. Last call for questions. Then I'm going to dinner. Oh, yeah. Uh, F. Launist here says, we started the Hank Redemption arc. That's right. X-Force number 48 came out today. We all know that a Beast Redemption arc... Like, the Krakoa era is going to end with all the mutants back on the board, with a redeemed Beast. Like, they're putting all the toys back in the box. And I think that is... Those elements are the least interesting by far, right? Like, there aren't many interesting stories to be told about putting the toys back in the box. You know? Um, like, I actually, honestly, like, I don't really want to see Beast Redeemed in X-Force. The book hasn't been about that. You know? Do it somewhere else. But, like, to me, if Percy puts a bow on this with, like, a redeemed heroic beast, that feels totally at odds with the years of comics, the thousands of issues that have been produced to this point. I don't know. I might check it out uh, when all is said and done, if people are, like, if anything interesting happens. All right. Let's see. What final questions? Let's see. All right. I think we're good. I think we're good here. I think we did a good job. Nice work, everyone. Covered some interesting comics today. Had two great ones, Resurrection Magneto and Mortal Thor. I would recommend reading all of Defenders if you haven't before. And then going into Resurrection Magneto. It's going to be worth it. Xavier says, Dave, do you think, like I do, that Storm is getting a bit too much love. How is she the one who fights Dominions in the Death World? Uh, no. I don't think Storm is getting too much love. I think she is one of the best X-Men characters. <laughs> like, unequivocally. And it's really cool to get to see her get some shine in this era. Um, as far as, like, this, the, you know, the, the actual like manifestation of how does storm, how does storm lightning a dominion? I don't know. <laughs> what is a dominion? <laughs> we don't know. Nobody understands this stuff. It's comics. So I'm per also like, I do think Ewing takes pains in Resurrection Magneto to be like, this is magic. How did she do it? Magically, literally. <laughs> right. And Ewing does have across these various works, like his own understanding of how magic operates. Right. And it, he says in that dominion fight, if from memory, but it's something to the effect of like, I will strike with the, you know, symbol of my power. Right. So she's not actually like pulling in lightning, but she's like using magic, which runs in her blood to, you know, strike with the the symbol because everything is based on symbols and signs and portents and all that, whatever. I don't understand it. But I, I do think there is care taken there. So no, I mean, good grief. No, like make this, give me more Storm stuff. She's one of the most interesting players of this entire era by far. I mean, we did, we did winners and losers of the Kirk era before, but I mean, Storm's a winner for sure. Like who are the biggest winners of the Kirk era? I'd say Storm, Mr. Sinister, um, kind of Apocalypse, but not really. We got Storm, Sinister, Mystique and Destiny have had a nice glow up, right? I, I mean, Biggest Losers, Professor X. Um, I'm just thinking of like the key players, Moira, biggest loser by the end. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, she's one of the biggest winners of the entire era, I think. It makes a lot of sense. Bruno says, reading Thor volume one, 272, 
after reading The New Thor 6 was great. That is the kind of fandom that I love to see. Going back, reading the old Thor, tying it into the new Thor. Well done. Well done. Um, Banksy says, Storm is fine. She deserved the shine, but I can see how people might think this is a bit too much. She is... She has just been, like, dominating everyone all the time. <laughs> I can't I can't remember the last time Storm had, like, a challenge. So, I mean, in that regard, I see where you're coming from. Doug Ramsey is a winner of the era. Psylocke and Jean are listed here. Are winners or losers? Sync, definite winner. Destiny, huge winner. A lot of sinks. A lot of votes for sinks. Huge winner. Biggest loser, forget me not. I'd say he's a winner. Heroic, sacrificial death that we all forgot. Nightcrawler, I would say loser. Polaris, winner. Craig of NASA is the biggest winner, Pepto-Bismol says. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, Adam says Colossus never had a chance this era. Colossus is a huge loser. Drop combo Legion if he ever comes back. Which one, winner or loser? I'm not actually sure. Cousin Marcus says, Dave, talk more about Moira. How dare you bait me like that? How dare you bait me? I'm a hungry man. I've, I've said this. I could not have been more clear. And you asked me to talk more about Moira? That's bait. I won't take it. I won't do it. She's the biggest loser. We're all the biggest loser of this era for Moira. Toad. I guess Toad's a loser. Sabretooth, winner. Multiple man, biggest loser. No, not biggest. A loser, yes. Uh, da, 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 da. Tempo, I guess winner. Most people wouldn't have known who Tempo was. Ooh, drop combo asked, Kid Omega, a winner. Uh, no, he's still a loser. Doesn't matter what happens. Cyclops, winner. Nah. He was he was a little listen, you can't be that excited about genocide and be a winner. That pertains to everyone in every walk of life. <laughs> okay. Cyclops is a loser. Chris says biggest loser is Alpha Flight. Alpha Flight is that that's the trophy, right? It's the Alpha Flight trophy for the biggest losers. Uh Franklin Richards, biggest loser. Franklin Richards isn't even in the competition anymore. Franklin Richards got disqualified. Drop combo says Duggan handed himself an L. Sick burn. Love it. Poor Banshee. <laughs> Banshee's almost a winner. Here's the case for Banshee as a winner. Is everyone... Banshee has everyone's sympathy now. Right? Like if you go to the pub... That's what we call it here in Chicago, the pub. If you go to the pub and you're like, yeah, my... My ex wore my skin <laughs> to break into the gala. You got everyone on your side. Everyone's got, you know, sympathy, shoulders to cry on. Who's not rooting for poor Banshee? And I feel like he's kind of a winner as a result. Because he, I mean, he got better. He got his skin back. He's fine. All right. Good votes, everybody. Thanks for being here. Will we be back next week? Nobody knows. Nobody ever knows. We'll probably be here on Thursday. I don't know. I was looking at the, the release list. Well, my, I might have to spice it up next week. I might have to try something a little different if I can make the time because the, the release list was kind of kind of bleh. I guess we got Sabretooth Wolverine stuff. Sabretooth being weird and violent. We got Avengers Twilight number two. Maybe we'll talk about that book. Um... If there's just ink wraps up, maybe we'll pour one out for Al, Dead X-Men. Eh, maybe we'll connect. All right, next Thursday, we'll do it. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Enjoy the comics. <laughs>